Well, today we are in Romans chapter 9. We've been going through our Romans series. Uh, and Romans 9 is, is it's kind of thick. And what I mean by kind of thick, it's kind of really heavy on doctrine, okay? So what I'm going to do is try to break it down into kind of bite-sized pieces. And I'm also going to bring out the point that there are some different views in the body of Christ um, on certain things, and I want to bring out all those different views, okay? So the first three verses we're going to look at is pretty easy, okay? So verse 1, it says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. So what he's saying is that I am willing, you know, Paul was willing to say, hey, I'm willing not just to, to lay down my life, but to lay down eternity. In other words, I'm willing to, to go to hell for my brethren if, if they some way they could be saved. And it's interesting because who were the main, you know, the, the ones who were actually persecuting Paul the most were the Jews, right? And yet he is willing to stand there and say, if, if I could win them to Christ, if they would come to Christ, I'm willing to lay down my eternal salvation, much like Moses did. If you remember back uh, where Moses went to get the Ten Commandments, and then as he's coming back, how Aaron and the, the Israelites had made a golden calf, and the Lord said, and then they were drunk, and they were sexual immorality was going on, and the Lord said, okay, step back, Moses, I'm going to destroy them all. And then Moses intercedes. In fact, he says, Lord, if you're going to do that, then blot my name out of your book, the book of life. So he also was interceding, lay, willing to lay down not just his life, but eternity for the people of Israel. And then, of course, the Lord relented. So it shows the heart of Paul, what he's willing to do. Okay, now let's look at verses 4 and 5. And it's, again, he says, For Christ, for the sake of my brothers, those who are my own race, the people of Israel. Now Israel, the name, you know what it Israel means is means governed by God. Governed by God. Now theirs is adoptions as sons. Theirs are divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God. Over all, forever, amen. So he's saying that the Jews, or actually the Israelites, back when they're the, the full 12 tribes, they were given the law, they were given the Shekinah glory that came down in the temple, they were given the temple worship, they were given the sacrifices, they were giving all these things, they were picked out of all the peoples of the world to have this, okay? And he makes it very clear in the Old Testament. He says, you know, you did not choose me. I chose you. And I didn't choose you because you were the biggest or the brightest or the greatest. He says, no, because you were the weakest. I chose you out of the people of all the earth to give these uh, attributes to you. The temple worship, the glory, the Shekinah glory, the receiving of the law, all those issues. And again, as he changed Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel, again meaning from supplanter to governed by God. Were they governed by God? 
actually didn't turn out too well. They were meant to be a light to the nations. They were meant to influence all the other nations. And instead, what happened, they ended up going into apostasy, worshiping other gods. And as a result of that, the northern kingdom of Israel, after the divided kingdom, in 722 B.C., were taken away by the Assyrians, conquered, brought as slaves and dispensed and lost to history, basically. And then in 5, 586 B.C., the southern kingdom of Judah, that's where we get the, the name Jew, and it wasn't what they called themselves, but it's what the Babylonians called them. They were taken away in 586 after their apostasy. So they were chosen, but if you go down to verse 27 of that same chapter, it says, Isaiah cried out concerning Israel, though the number of Israelites be like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. So, because what we're going to get into just a little bit later about election, about um, predestination, I want you to think about this. So the Israelites were chosen. They were the elect of the Old Testament. And yet, it was only a remnant that was saved. Okay? Because that is going to apply to one of this next section. So verse 6 through 9, because of their failure, and Paul says, it is not, it is not as though God's word has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the, prom is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. So he says, not everybody who is descended, in other words, it's not about ethnicity, okay? And so he's bringing out the point that we would call spiritual Israel, which would be equated with the church or the ecclesiastic which is made up of Jew and Gentile, male and female. And so you always have to, as you look at, at the term even Israel, governed by God, you have to know the, 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 the context of what it's stated. So this is one of the few places where Israel is used in the spiritual sense or spiritual Israel, talking about also including the church. The church, Israel, same as one thing. Normally, the vast majority of times you go through Scripture, Israel is either referred to all the 12 tribes of Israel or even after the divided kingdom and after the 10 tribes of the north were taken away, even sometimes Jeremiah, who is prophesying to Judah, will use the term Israel, calling them Israel. So it can be a little confusing, so you always have to get the context of what he was using. Now, because of this spiritual Israel, since same as a church, there is a, um, a, a theology that's called replacement theology, okay? And some of it is true and some of it is not true because the parts that are true is what we just said, that, that Israel, in the spiritual sense, is the same as a church, okay? It's the ecclesia. It's the, it's the joining of the Jew and Gentile together in one body. But where replacement theology can get off is where then they take it too far 
and they begin to say, well, God is through with Israel. He has no purpose for the Jews. He has no purpose for Israel. All the promises that are in the Old Testament, that's now for the church. So that's why you, we use the term replacement theology. And while I think that first part is true, the second part is not. I believe Israel still has a purpose. The Jewish people still have, and as we get into chapter 11, you're going to see some of that, that they're going to be grafted back in, that they, there is yet a future. But those who believe in strict replacement theology would say, no, they're, you know, God is through with them. And, you know, my personal view is, no, they're, he's not. There's still yet future. There's things that still happen. But, plus, let me, sometimes the most extreme part of that can actually carry over into anti-Semitism. Because they think, okay, God is through with the Jews, through with Israel, so they're the, they're the ones who killed Christ. And so they can almost become anti-Semitic, which is obviously very wrong. Okay, on the other hand, what I've seen happening in, within Christians many times is there's almost an infatuation with Israel where nothing they do can be wrong. You know, for me, I've always supported Benjamin Netanyahu, okay, just as a leader. I thought he's doing a good job. Uh, he seems to be open to Christians, but recently some things have happened in Israel, I don't know if you're aware of, there's been a big divide going on about the Supreme Court, and Netanyahu has been pushing to reduce the power of the Supreme Court. Well, what I found out was that in that is a change where the rabbinical court, the Jewish rabbinical courts, from the rabbis, would have more power than the Supreme Court. Also, because what's happened in the Knesset is some of the ultra-Orthodox uh, and the Orthodox have gained more power. They are not friends of Christians. In fact, they're the ones who are persecuting the Messianic believers. The Messianic believers just means Jewish believers who are in Israel, okay? They're being persecuted by the Orthodox because they do not like, obviously, people converting to Christianity. Also, in this last week, they have been denying the visas for Christian ministries coming in to the land. Some of these organizations have been there for, you know, 20, 30 years, and they're being denied um, visas to support their ministries there. So you have to be careful, you know, because I, I find some people on extremes on both sides of this issue. So we don't want to be obviously on the anti-Semitism or not believing that God is done with the Jews. We believe there's a future yet that is yet to appear and yet to have, you know, to come about. Another thing, while well, this warning, while well, I'm going on this, is that I've seen some Christians who have supported and actually sent money for the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. If they were to build a temple in Jerusalem and begin the sacrificial system again, I believe it would be a stench in the nostrils of God because they're going back to the, taking the blood of Jesus and just... No, we're, we're going back to the blood of, of goats and bulls. And so I think that's actually, we, if you're going to support somebody financially there, support the Messianic believers. Those Jewish Christians who are, have the different houses of prayer, they have different congregations scattered throughout the land, support those. So we just need to be aware of what's happening. So... Replacement theology, again, has a little bit of truth to it, but it also has some excesses to it. Now, this next section, 10 through 24, 
Okay, this is where we have a, a large divide in the body of Christ. Because this section is probably one of the strongest sections for Calvinist, Reformed. Uh, and so let, let me kind of describe what that difference is, okay? So there's Armenians on the one side, and I lean towards Armenians. I'm going to be, you know, I want to be open about that. And then there's Calvinists, or, or Reformed, or Predestination on the other side. So I went, because uh, I thought, I wonder how some of these people handled that, and I kind of had an idea of what would happen. So I picked somebody that uh, everyone would know who's a Calvinist, and I picked somebody else who was an Armenian, and just to see what they said on these verses. And, of course, each one only gave their views. Surprise, huh? Not really surprised, but they only gave their what they thought was the truth of this. And I think that's disingenuous because I think you have to be open. You have to, to give both sides uh, because like for us, for Church on the Rock, we don't have a doctrine set whether you're a Calvinist or a Minion, either side. That's up for you. That's up for you to study the priesthood of believers, for you to study the word, for you to come up. So you have these two different camps. And actually, I'd say there's probably a third camp which is a, a lot of people who would say, I really don't care how it happened. I'm just glad it happened, you know. So, but the two different camps. Okay, so uh, Reformed or Calvinist, that would include most of your Baptists, Presbyterians. Uh, so if, if you took Harrisonville, there's a lot of Baptist churches, Okay probably more Baptist churches than there are any other church, okay? And then there's some other ones like uh, Cedar Ridge. That'd be a reform, which is, still has that Calvinistic bent. And what they believe, a couple different things that are, make the big difference is they believe in unconditional election. Okay, what that means is they believe that God chose you had nothing to do with you. You didn't make a choice. God strictly chose you, but he didn't chose this person. Okay? It's all God, and that's it. They believe in irresistible grace, which means that grace is given to you, and you're not really able to resist it. It will overcome any resistance that might have been in you. You're going to be saved. Okay, the third big point would be that, which is what they call perseverance of the saint, which you might be more familiar with, <clears throat> once saved, always saved. So if you're truly saved, if you're truly chosen, you will never turn your back on the Lord. You will never reject him, okay? While Armenians uh, believe in conditional election, in other words, it's about you believing, too, about the Lord, you making the choice, either rejecting the Lord or receiving the Lord, okay? You have a, you have a choice. You're not chosen. In other words, you could, and also would not believe in the perseverance of the saints or once saved, always saved. In other words, you would always have the opportunity to reject the Lord, even if you had received him once, you might get to the point where you're going, hey, I'm done. I don't want to have anything else about God. I'm rejecting him. You would always have that freedom. So see, there's quite a bit of difference there in the thoughts. And yet it's not a salvation issue at all. It's only about how it happens. And again, I, I think there's another big group that would say, I don't care how it happened, I just know that I'm glad it happened, you know, that I have been saved, that I have the, the grace has been extended to me. Now, the full, actually, uh, Calvinists have a, what's called the five points of Calvinism, and it's spelled tulip, okay? So the two, the T, I'm sorry, 
The T means total depravity. That man is totally depraved, unable to obviously save himself. The U is unconditional election. Again, what we talked about earlier, it's unconditional. It's just you were chosen. This person was chosen. This person was chosen. In other words, you might be chosen, but your, your husband or your wife might not be, or your children might not be. Limited atonement, the L is for limited atonement, meaning the atonement, what Christ died for, the blood that was shed, was limited to those that God chose, okay? The I, that tulip, is irresistible grace, which we talked about before. And the P is for the perseverance of the saints, or again, we would say once saved, always saved. Okay, so before we read through this passage, anybody have any questions on that part? <laughs> and again, it's, it's not really something that should even divide us, but it has as far as that's why we have so many different denominations. And again, my, my point is that you have the freedom to believe what you discern from the Bible, what your own personal view is, okay? Uh, another, like I say, this passage we're going to read through is a very strong part for Calvinism. Another one would be uh, Ephesians chapter 1 would be very strong towards that Calvinistic view or Reformed view. So let's read through 10 through 24. It says, not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good, are bad in order that God's purpose in election might stand. Not by works, but by him who calls, she was told. The older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So you read that, and then your, your first question should be coming to your mind, well, that doesn't sound fair. But verse 14, he says, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Verse 16, it does not therefore depend on, man, on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raise you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. So that would bring up the next question in verse 19. So one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who resists his will? But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed same to him who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, born with, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction. What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, 
even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. So that's pretty strong from a Calvinistic viewpoint. And so that's something you have to consider. I think sometimes too many people read this with a preconceived notion of what this means. And I think you need to study it for yourself. You need to look at it, and you need to make a determination. I would say one thing in the... um, Going back to, you know, what it said in, in, uh, about the, the Jews, the Israelites in the Old Testament being chosen and being elected but not yet saved. That is one thing to kind of look at that. But I think in chapter 8, I just want to look at one verse quickly. And verse 29, the preceding chapter said, For those who God foreknew... He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So it says, those who he foreknew. So from our Armenian point of view, they would look at that, this scripture and say, well, what the difference is, is that it's not that God chose you, it's that God foreknew, had foreknowledge, and knew what decisions you were going to make. Okay? He knew, he knows the end from the beginning. He knew you before you were, you were made and knew what decisions you were made. So that's, that's the other side, okay? So this, again, it, it's one of the major things why we have different denominations. And yet, you know, I, I, when I was pastoring a Baptist church, no one ever asked me what my views were on that which I thought kind of is interesting. So some churches would be very strong on that, so you either toe the line and you only preach it one way or else you're out of here. And some, they're more lenient, that leaves it more up to the individual believers. You believe what you study, what you come up with, what your belief is. Now, as I said before, you know, he talked about back in that, uh, about Pharaoh, you know, because if you go back to, uh, to Exodus, there are ten times where it says Pharaoh hardened his heart, and there's ten times where it says God hardened his heart, okay? Which I think also can be a warning to us, you know, that you can harden your heart to the point where the Lord finally says, okay, enough. Is enough. Now, to me, the weakest part of the Calvinistic view is the once saved, always saved, or the per- perseverance of the saints. In other words, if you were, um, if you're truly chosen, then you will never turn your back on the Lord. Okay. Now, to me, that's, that's the weakest link. And so I'm going to look at some scriptures now. We're going to go to Hebrews, look at a few scriptures, give you some examples. And I'll, I'll go ahead and give you what the Calvinists would say in these cases. They would say, that person was never really saved, okay? So, so if you turn over to Hebrews chapter 3, And we're going to look at uh, verse 6. And it says, But Christ is a faithful as a son over God's house. And we are his house. If, that big word, two-letter word, if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. So the big if in there, and if you drop down to verse 12, same chapter, through 14, he says, See to it, brothers, that none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, 
so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if, there's that word again, if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. So that big if word in there, right? In chapter 6 of Hebrews, verses 4 through 6, it says, It is, is impossible for those who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be, to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. So these people have been enlightened. They have tasted the heavenly gift. They had shared in the Holy Spirit. So that tells me they at one time were saved. Second Peter chapter 2. In verse 20 to 22, and it says, If they have escaped the, cor the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, okay, knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it and overcome they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn back their backs on the sacred commands that was passed on to them. Of this, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to his vomit and his soul, a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud. Again, very clearly saying, they have come to knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Also in 2 Peter, verse 3 and verse 17, Therefore, dear friends, you already know this. Be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men, and fall from your secure position. How can you fall from your secure position unless you were there at one time? So to me, again, that is the, the greatest weakness within that viewpoint because it's all five of those are tied together. And I believe that you always have that freedom to say, you know, Lord, I don't, I, I don't believe you anymore. I don't want any part of you. I don't want anything to do with you. I'm done. You have that freedom. All right. So now let's go back to Romans chapter 9. So I know there's a lot in here. There's a lot to think about. And again, I, I would uh, encourage you to, to go to Ephesians chapter 1, read that, because that's a pretty strong uh, Calvinistic point of view there. Also, if you are a Armenian like me, I would suggest you get some books on Calvinism to look at what the other side says. If you are a Calvinist, I would suggest you get a book that talks about the Armenian view, so that you're not just reinforcing your own view, but you're looking to see, to try to find what the truth is, okay? And if you're in a third group, then you can just relax, okay? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so back to Romans chapter 9, and we're going to pick it up 
in uh, verse 25, I think where we left off, because he, he switches now from spiritual Israel, and he's switching back to ethnic Israel, in verse, starting in verse 25. And he says to Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. He's talking about Gentiles here. And it will happen in that very place where it was said to them, you are not my people. They will be called sons of a living God. Now Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the numbers of the Israelites be like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles, who did not pursue righteousness, have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as that was but as it were by works. They stumble over the stumbling stone. As it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble and rock that makes them fall. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So it says Jesus is the stumbling stone. It's what they stumbled over. They were trying to get a righteousness by following the law, and they failed, as each one of us would have failed, and only by faith in Christ. So again, this, this series of, of Romans chapter 9 is, is kind of pretty heavy in doctrine, and it, you know, doctrine is something that we all want to study. We all want to come up with what we believe is the truth of God's Word. And again, in here, you have the freedom to choose what you believe, okay? What you discern through your study of the Scriptures, which camp you might say you fall in. But again, it does not need to be a place of division. It's, and it's sad that it has happened. That Again, why we have so many denominations, because sometimes we make such a big deal over something that's, it's not a salvation issue, but it is about salvation, but it's not, you know, it doesn't affect your salvation. It's just how you perceive it, how you believe in it. So, after all that, anybody have, feel, have any questions? Need a clarification, something you don't understand or a terminology you didn't understand? Feel free to raise your hand and we'll deal with it. I'd like to, I didn't look it up, but I'd like to just see what the, you know, percentage was on either side. You know, how many Calvinists are they compared to Armenian? And then how that compares to the, like, say, the unofficial third group. You say, I don't really care. I just want to be in it. So, but it's something to consider so that when you hear these things, when you hear somebody say, you know, a Calvinistic you know, view are, they use the term reformed, you know what they're talking about. You know their viewpoint. And actually a lot of the great, you know, revivalists even have been Calvinists. You know, some of the great awakening leaders were Calvinists. Now, there is what some people call hyper-Calvinism, which 
in their churches, they would never give an altar call. Because they said, if we gave an altar call and somebody came forward, they might think they're saved when they weren't really chosen. Yeah. So, and, and so some of even the Calvinists, Reformed, will not agree with them. So it can be different camps within the camp, in other words. Okay. So again, this is more, this chapter is more theology. It's more about how things happen, and, 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 and Paul is pointing these things out. And as we get into the next couple chapters, 10 and 11, we're especially having to deal with, with the, the Jewish people and the future there. Uh, and then as you get into 12 and beyond, it's more about, okay, knowing all this, how now shall you live? How do you walk your faith out? And so as you go through Romans, it, it's kind of step by step. You know, it's kind of well thought out. He's kind of got a plan, and, he, and he's showing how it goes. So anyway, we'll stop there.